Why don't you do a show about the Jersey Devil? Jersey Devil. Fucking Jersey fucking devil. Devil? Deviled Jersey. <laughs> devil your jerseys. Oh boy, man. Have I got a Garth Corner song for you. It's going to knock your socks off because we have a new patron, so I actually tried this time. It's going to be <laughs> great. I'm building it up because I want to cash the check my tongue filled or how how's that metaphor work i'm not done with it yet oh but i will be and it better be good because i'm building it up now speaking of you know ca- uh cashing checks that your mouth's right uh i write a pretty <laughs> oh, that's big it. yeah that's i write it. a pretty big check in this episode okay I hope that i do a good job is it something like we need to do another episode about this no because we do do that sometimes. you'll see Sometimes we even do another episode about it after we do. Okay, well, should we get started? Is the do 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 do? Yeah, yeah, it's happening. Okay, it's happening. Hello, dig for bones. I don't think anyone knows that I'm the one who cut off your toes and put them in the drawer with the side. Hello, and welcome to the Least Haunted Podcast, a place where science, skepticism, humor, and anthropology meet to discuss- Humor? Humor and anthropology meet to discuss all things spooky, haunting, supernatural, and sometimes just the plain ridiculous. I'm your host, Cody Franks, and joining me as almost always is jumping, jubilant, jousting, justly against jerks, jealously judging jewels as Jersey Jezebels, joyously defeating the dastardly devil from Leeds- Garth. Yeah, I do sometimes do that. Sometimes, man. Sometimes I do do that. Everyone has those days. Oh, yeah. Uh, that came from uh, Ken. Thank with you, two Ken. On As Discord. always. Thank you, Ken. On the Discord. That was wonderful. Discord. Come join us on the Discord. And then also Patreon. We have a Patreon. You can support us on Patreon. And sometimes those two things intersect like tomorrow night. Maybe if when this comes out, when you say tomorrow night, you mean uh, Saturday, Saturday, the 28th of September, uh-huh. the year of our science, <laughs> the year of our science, God, 2024 be and to them. Yeah, we're going to be watching a movie maybe mm. in the Monster Squadron hangout, but we'll talk about that later. OK, what are we talking about God, now? Do you know about the coastline paradox? Um, is that where it's like, uh, the coastline has a certain, uh, length to it if you measure out, like, the, the edge, but the further in you look, the more, uh, detailed it is, so the more you're measuring, and really it turns out a coastline is, like, infinitely long if you're really looking at the details. Yeah, so, yeah, the smaller the increment of measurement. I'm so proud of myself. That, no, I'm, yeah, I had a, I had a (laughs) feeling that you would Well, I didn't know it was called that, but I've heard something about that yeah. so that was a good guess on my you part. might have even heard it from me at some point <laughs> that's very likely <laughs> but, often i'll regurgitate stuff you told me and thrilled to tell you about it Cody. And that's how I know and you're you often learn- nice enough to be like that's super interesting garth that's how i know you're learning uh <laughs> so yeah the smaller the increment of measurement used or the finer level of detail yeah the longer a coastline becomes, in theory. So, yeah, like you said, yeah, it could be infinite. That's Im- imagining that there aren't waves, because that's a whole other thing. Yeah, it's always changing. Coastlines change but, in length all the time. Uh, so, when researching topics for Least Haunted, I often run into the coastline paradox. Ah. Uh, sometimes what seems like a simple, straightforward story about a ghost or a monster, upon further inspection, becomes an illustration of how interconnected, seemingly disparate things really I are. I would go so far as to say you always run into that with every episode. Yeah. From the most unlikely, smallest of seeds grow the widest and fullest of canopies. <laughs> Case in point is today's topic. Uh, I'm going to illustrate how if you follow the right threads, the English Reformation of Henry VIII decided the winner of the 1995 Stanley Cup. Wow. Now, was that before the Roar of the Roses? Because Henry VIII was the After. Six Wives. The War of the Roses comes in slightly during Garth's Corner, so oh. we're going to be doing a lot of English history here. Yes. Oh, no. Yeah, we're getting a lot this time. Okay. This is the story of the Jersey Devil. All right. Garth, you ever heard of the Jersey Devil? Yeah, I, I have to the degree that it's like, oh, um, well, it's kind of like uh, I, I mentioned in the last episode, every state has its spookiest thing. Yeah. The, the, the watchers of Big Sur were California, and the Jersey Devil is always listed as the spooky thing of Jersey. But beyond that, I think they uh, that is a team mascot as well, the Jersey Devils, mm-hmm. and, a, and I think a team name of some kind of sport. Some kind of sportings do that. But beyond <laughs> that, I'm unaware of anything to do with what the Jersey Devil is supposed to be about. Okay. 
Okay. Well, you're going to be an expert by the end of this. Okay. All right. So we're going to start with kind of last time we started describing the setting, which was in the last one, it was Big Sur, right? Oh, yeah. So we're going to talk about- And now the beautiful Jersey Shore. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> okay. I, the, the Pine Barrens. Can I tell oh. you about the Pine Barrens? Yeah, please. I've never heard of this. So the Atlantic Coastal Pine Barrens is a forested ecoregion of the northeastern United States. And when I say ecoregion, uh, that's like an, it's an area that's defined through ecology, i.e. what lives there, mm. and geography, where it is mm -hmm. or what it is. So it's like when we say the Amazonian rainforest or the Mojave Desert. Okay. So it's like the Atlantic Coastal Pine Barrens it was once this big expanse of forest that went from Massachusetts all the way through southern New Jersey and wow. down into Maryland. Hard to imagine New Jersey being forested. That's cool. Uh, it still largely is. Is it really? Uh, yeah. I, as we're going to find I, out. See, when I think of Jersey, I think of the Jersey Shore and like Quick Stop and, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so over millions of years, the rising and falling sea levels along the Atlantic coast deposited s sandy soil pretty far inland. Uh, wow. And this type of sand, they call it sugar sand, which Is it sounds very delightful. fine? Yeah. Okay. Um, it, it's kind of like broken up sandstone because that's okay. kind of what it is. Uh, so you end up with this like plateau that runs along the coast. And on top of that, you find these pine forests. Does it go very far inland? Depends. Okay. Um, in the case of New Jersey, New Jersey is actually kind of like a little peninsula that juts oh, off. Okay. Uh, on one side, you have like the bay that's made from the Delaware River. Running yeah, it, into it the pokes ocean. towards uh, Manhattan and yeah, New the, York, so you have, right? It's, yeah. it's basically two rivers on either side ah. that empty into the ocean. Uh, across one, you have New York, and on the other river to the south, you get Philly, and Philadelphia, oh, okay. and Pennsylvania's right wow. there. They're all so close. Mm -hmm. The East Coast is amazing. <laughs> Everything is so close. <laughs> so actually, the Pine Barrens that are in New Jersey are the largest remaining section of this forest. There's a chunk of it, I think, on Staten Island. There's a little bit in Massachusetts, and then you have the New Jersey Pine Barrens. Why is it called Barrens? It's a forest. We're going to get to that. Oh, okay. It's called the Pine Barrens because, well, it's full of pines. And okay. then the poor sandy soil. Oh, it's barren. It makes it uh -huh. like Im almost impossible to farm there. Only the pines love it. Yes. Okay. Uh, the pines, and actually there's uh, a dozen species of orchids that are found nowhere else in the world other than the New Jersey Pine Barrens because orchids are one of the few plant families that Orchid, have... Orchids want nothing. Well, they have the ability to absorb uh, their nutrition through the air. I've, I've had an orchid that I rescued from a Trader Joe's uh, trash can like eight or nine years ago, and I've never fed it anything except for an ice cube every three weeks. It's because, and it has yeah. no dirt in its um, thing, and no, it, it's very happy. You ever heard of like uh, air plants? plants that, oh, like, yeah. No, we have a few. Yeah, yeah. Orchids are like that. They're absorbing a lot of their nutrients through the air. So wow. they do well in the Pine Barrens. Uh, there's also uh, dwarf forests that are there uh, because of the low nutrient content of the soil. The trees are stunted. Uh, and then you have the cedars and there's pitch pines, uh, a whole bunch of carnivorous plants. Ooh, Some wow. of it is uh, swampy. There's a huge uh, aquifer underneath oh, it. Okay. Uh, and in 1978, that was actually all designated as one of the first federally protected like, I imagine nature it's preserves. kind of brackish if it's right by the... Uh, uh, and the ocean. water, the water is like red because of all the tannic acid Whoa. from the cedars, except for there's this one place called the blue hole, which is like a sinkhole full of water that is like, Super uh, blue? sapphire blue. Wow. And they're like, yeah, we don't know why that's that way. It should be red <laughs> like everything else, but. Mm. Wow. And then contrary to its name, uh, there's not so many pines there as there are white cedar, but white cedar barrens, but the name stays. Okay. 10,000 years ago, the ancestors of the Lenape people first entered this area, ah. and they figured out that the quality of soil could be improved somewhat by regularly burning the underbrush. Oh, and then that's- uh, Nutrients and ash. Yeah, the nutrients from the ash will enrich the, yeah. the sand. <laughs> but even through this process, there were never any like large permanent agricultural settlements in the area. Hmm. Even into like European colonial time- uh, you don't find like huge farming communities, but there are small communities that are scattered out there. Okay. So the low population density continues to the present. New Jersey is the most densely populated state by like area to, you know. Wait, you said the low population density continues to present. Of the Pine Barrens. Oh, not of people. Got it. Yes. Okay. So the, the New Jersey Pine Barrens has a low, po has actually I one see. of the lowest population densities on the entire East Coast of the United States. In the New Jersey Pine Barrens, which is in the state that has the highest population density of any state. Uh, gotcha. They're all they're all clumped in along the shore. Yes. Okay. 
Just because it was poor for agricultural use didn't mean that it wasn't attractive to European settlers and colonizers for a few reasons. Uh, Shipbuilders began harvesting timber for ships. The boggy, swampy terrain of some of the areas in the Pine Barrens yields a thing called bog iron, which before the discovery of iron-rich ore deposits in, I think, like Pennsylvania, decades later, yeah. it meant that the Pine Barrens were one of the few sources of iron that was readily available. So the uh, people go out there digging in the bogs and harvesting bog iron, as it's called. To What were they doing with that? Casting metal iron. So well, many, are, of the, many were these were these the indigenous people? No, the, this oh, is the. Colo- oh, okay. I said once we got to colonial times. Okay, gotcha, we're, gotcha. We're, yeah, we moved a little. Ahead. I was like, what? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Sorry, gotcha. you missed that. No, it, it's all right. You you said it. I was thinking about bogs. <laughs> no bog mummies. No, like many of the cannons that were used by the Continental Army during the American Revolution were cast from Pine Barren bog iron. Shot into the bogs and then went back to the bogs from whence they came. Probably, yeah. During the New Jersey Wars. <laughs> the uh, Revolutionary War. <laughs> there was also vast charcoal producing operations scattered throughout the Pine Barrens that used large stone kilns, the remains of which have become the source of their own legends and folklore in modern times. Ah. But that's a different story. Oh. Uh, there's grist mills, uh, which are flour mills. They were built in the area. Uh, you could they couldn't grow the grain, but they could process it. Was like, this like amber grist in um, over well, over the garden wall? Uh, in, in over the garden wall, they had the grist mill. The old grist mill was converted to crush. Uh, what do they call it? Um, the oil trees. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. But no, um, that was something else. Grist Am- is Amber a- grist. Amber grist comes from Wales. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> yes, they had flour mills. Okay, <laughs> got it. The remote and scattered nature of the settlements in the pines led to a lot of perceptions regarding those who lived there or who chose to live out there. Weird folk. They called them pineys or pine rats. <laughs> um, and in the early 20th century, there was a pro eugenics movement that published a book about a family that lived in the Pine Barrens. They were called the Calicacs. And mm-hmm. the book explained that the people living in the Pine Barrens were incredibly inbred and idiotic, and they used them as an example and reason for why human beings needed to be selectively bred and why genetically inferior should be avoided at all costs that's, and for, for, for preferably just done away with. That's sort of a counter-argument because... If you're going to be selective about breeding, that's a smaller breeding population. And look how but you're, look what but you're happens. Choosing the good look genes. what happens when you get really small. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if that's a good argument. It turns out that the the whole study behind the book was just uh, fraud. Like they had that sounds misconstrued everything. And it I'm was not propaganda. surprised. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, the Pine Barrens is the forest primeval. It's the barren, inhospitable landscape that we find the tale of the Jersey Devil, ah. or as it was originally known, the Leeds Devil. And now we come to the crux of things. What the hell is the Jersey Devil? Hey, Cody. What the hell is the Jersey Devil? In 1735, in the area that today is known as Leeds Point, there lived a woman named Jenny Leeds. And she had a problem. She had 12 children, and the family was barely getting by as it was. She lived in a shoe. (laughs) When she discovered that she was pregnant for a 13th time, she allegedly cursed the unborn child and proclaimed that it would be a devil. (laughs) <laughs> or that the devil could have it, depending on which story you hear. Ah. On a stormy night, she went into labor, and family and close friends were at the bedside to help with the delivery. The child, a boy, was born healthy and fine. But then, mm. suddenly, he began to contort and transform. Oh. He spouted hooves, a goat's head, <gasps> oh, no. bat wings, and a forked <laughs> tail. Oh, no. Screaming, he attacks everybody in attendance. She's all like, boy, I'm glad you sprouted those after you, you <laughs> came right? out of me. That's yeah. a lot of pointy things. Uh, he's slapping everybody with his tail. A whip crack went just from the tail. <laughs> and, then, uh... and the beast was... was... <laughs> he oh. wasn't done. Instead, uh-huh. he flies up the chimney, out into the night, into the Pine Barrens, to terrorize the countryside. They always fly up the chimney after they turn into monsters. Yeah, the cat. Uh, Remember the, what the, the replacement babies? What were those? The doppelganger babies? Where people's babies would suddenly turn into little monster babies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They would fly up the chimney too. And the uh, the, the king of cats went up the chimney. Oh, he's up the chimney up with the these chimney. guys. Santa Claus goes down. These yeah, guys go up. Yeah, they Good things chimneys. come down chimney. Bad <laughs> things go up. I think uh, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm learning here. Okay. So thus begins the legend of the Leeds Devil. The Leeds Devil. Now, is there a place called Leeds around here? Uh, at the time? It's called Leeds Point. Okay. 
Uh, and it's because a bunch of people named Leeds end up living in there, and then it becomes retroactively called Leeds Point. Okay. Uh, in some tellings of the tale, Mother Leeds, as she becomes known, was actually a witch, and the child's father was the devil himself. Oh, yeah. Okay. Sometime in the early 1800s, so this is like 1735, devil's born. <laughs> early 1800s, Commodore Stephen Decatur, he's a Commodore in the U.S. Navy, he's there to inspect some cannonballs and cannons that are being made from bog iron at a foundry in the Pine Barrens. They're still making cannons. Yeah. It's the early 1800s. I get ready for that War of 1812. Yeah, okay. And when he sees an unidentified creature flying overhead, and it's claimed that he orders these new cannons to be fired upon it. I guess it's like, well, we got to test them on something. <laughs> right? Hey, there's this thing flying up there. I don't know what it is. And I also love that, like, you know, with the gray man and this, it's like, the first gut instinct. What is it? Shoot it. Let's yeah, 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 yeah. What is that? That, that, that is that is the 19th century. But even remember we talked about Bigfoot too. Those like guys are out there prospecting for gold. And they yeah. see what looks like a gorilla. Kill it. Yeah, <laughs> right? kill it so we can find out what it is. Oh, it came in peace. It's bringing love. Don't let it get away. Break its legs. Yeah. Uh, sometime around 1820, Joseph Bonaparte, who was Napoleon Bonaparte's older brother. Oh. Uh, I guess he emigrated to the United States. Wow. He had a hunting estate in Bordertown, New Jersey, which is in the Pine Barrens. And while out hunting, he claimed that he had seen the Leeds Devil. Ah, he was out there. The legends are round. Yeah. yeah. By the mid-19th century, the Leeds Devil was well enough known in the scattered communities of the Pine Barrens that in 1859, Atlantic Monthly Magazine published an article about the various legends of the Leeds Devil. Is this like the same Atlantic as the Atlantic when... The, like the current Atlantic? It might be. Okay. Or, you know, like what that is named after. Because this is back uh, 1850s. Mid-1800s, yeah. you said. Okay. A newspaper in Burlington County, New Jersey in 1887 talks about uh, some sightings of a winged creature that they, they call the, the Devil of Leeds. Uh, quote, whenever we went near it, it would give a mostly unearthly yell that frightened the dogs. It whipped to every dog on the place. That thing, said the colonel, is not a bird nor an animal, but it is the Leeds devil, according to the description. And it was born over in Evesham, Burlington County, a hundred years ago. No. There's no mistake about it. I never saw the horrible <laughs> critter myself, but I can remember when... Well, when it was roaming around in Evesham Woods 50 years ago, and when it was hunted by men and dogs and shot at by the best marksmen there were in all of South Jersey, but could not be killed. There isn't a family in Burlington or any of the adjoining counties that does not know of the Leeds Devil. And it was the bugaboo to frighten children with when <laughs> I was a boy. Uh, bugaboo is like boogeyman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. I've always heard bugaboo used as, oh, that's a little bugaboo. Like, that's a irritating thing or a problem someone has with a thing i think yeah uh, it might be kind of like how like a gremlin it's something that, you know or a kobold yeah. there's something that vexes you yeah vexer yeah uh so however no point during this time is it called the jersey devil it's called the leeds devil right or the devil of leeds the name change comes in 1909 mm, so pretty recent 1909 the Leeds Devil was the subject of a mass hysteria event that swept the greater Philadelphia and New Jersey area. Really? Wow. Yeah. So beginning on January 16th, various newspapers of the area were flooded with tales of sightings and even attacks occurring everywhere from Philadelphia to various cities and towns all over New Jersey and even into the state of Maryland. Wow. Far, far and wide, the Jersey Devil has awoken. Yeah. And it was during this brief episode that the name the Jersey Devil seems to have been coined by newspapers because as they're talking about it, they're like, oh, well, this thing, the Leeds Devil, it's been around in New Jersey you know, it's a New Jersey thing. And then it's like that right. devil from New Jersey. And then it becomes the Jersey it, Devil. It, it became more ge generalized as it spread and wreaked havoc yeah. further away from Leeds. So I've got a few little um, little snippets uh, okay. from some of these newspaper articles. Are you going to do a newspaper man voice? A continental voice. <laughs> Which, yeah. Okay. Yeah, do the continental voice. <clears throat> This is my role here. Cody, do the voice. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> dance, monkey, dance! Dance, monkey, you did all the research. Now do the voice. Okay. <laughs> so I, I can laugh. <laughs> all yeah. of Gloucester County seems to be aroused by the mysterious tracks found since the late snow, and some of the older residents declare it to be the Leeds Devil, <laughs> which makes periodical visits about there. The last of these visits was in 1904, but many people remember a visit 35 years ago. <laughs> Oh, uh, and then it continues. <clears throat> uh, 
Gloucester County surrogate Silver, I don't know what that means, remembers these <laughs> tracks 30 years ago in Clayton, and when the town was on the verge of nervous prostration over them. At that time, excitement ran so high that the men shouldered guns and went to the woods, calling out, If you are the devil, rattle your chains! <laughs> Um, oh, that says something about what the people of the time thought about the jet devil, that the devil's in chains. Interesting. And, and now we start getting some uh, more concrete descriptions. Uh, before, they always talked about it being this kind of like... It sounded pretty generic. Horns, hooves, yes. bat wings, tail. Yeah, yeah. tail. So there's a captain, a sea captain, uh, who claims to have fought the Jersey, this devil, and he kills it after oh. a fierce ba battle. Uh, it attacked him offshore, he said. It flew at him oh. two miles offshore, uh, and he, he beat it to death with an oar. Nice. But he uh, didn't bring the body back to he shore. He did, but he didn't show it to like any newspaper men. <laughs> Some of his other fish buddies came and saw it, and okay. they're fishermen, and they were like, oh, yeah, that thing's crazy. Uh, <laughs> and he said that it was like, so it's a winged creature, uh -huh. and it was like the, uh, it was the, uh, where's the quote? Oh, here we go. Five feet in height, 150 pounds in weight, a cross between a crane and a pelican, the likes of which they had never seen before. So it's a bird. Is it like an albatross? <laughs> Just um, a giant bird? <laughs> they start saying they see the devil bird, right? Okay, so, okay. it's a devil bird now. So he's okay. a bird, but then that's like the, the, the most um, subdued uh. of the descriptions. This is when we end up getting the classic picture if you look up the jersey devil oh there's a classic picture there's a classic picture so of you're him. telling me i won't have to work as hard for the episode art no okay <laughs> is this the first one yeah 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 <laughs> the top left one <laughs> <laughs> so he's got like a head that's the a mixture. It's a gigantic head. Yeah, well, they make so the head it looks kind of like a, a camel. Uh, camel with a little bit bigger ears, with kind of a derpy expression, big old long neck, and a teeny tiny body with super spindly little legs and big old cloven, not even cloven like horse hooves. And then, yeah, bat wings and a tail, but it's the, it's the... A long forked tail. It is the least scary devil you've ever seen. <laughs> uh, yeah, they describe him having There's like no a... way he can stand up. He, he must be rearing up. He could never stand. Well, look at those tiny little front legs or arms. Yeah, yeah, he's like a, like a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Yeah, so he's got bat-like wings, uh... A horse-like head, or described as a horse-like head, but round ears. Uh, some say his eyes glow red. He's got red eyes that, that glow. That would make him moderately more scary. He leaves his little hoof prints all over the place. <laughs> uh, and he's flying around. Flying around and hoofing around. So this, this panic spreads. It starts on the 16th. In one town, it's reported that the local police department have, like, a battle with this creature where they fire in, at it in the air. Oh, wow. There's armed vigilante mobs that are wandering the Pine Barrens. <laughs> Schools close out of fear that it could attack the children. Wow, this is like, people were really scared. <laughs> The oh, Philadelphia man. Zoo doesn't help because they offer a $10,000 reward for the creature. <laughs> you think that ship's captain would have gone and claimed the reward, but he didn't. Yeah. Mm. You even first, end up... first. You even end up with a few thing. hoaxes. Oh, naturally. Once there's a reward, people are going to start taking dead animals and stitching um, them together and saying, here's the Jersey Devil. Two local guys, Jacob Hope and Norman Jeffries, hoaxed a capture of the monster and they charged a small fee to look at a kangaroo that they had painted green and oh. glued feathers and antlers to. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Wait, how did they get a kangaroo? Right? <laughs> Surely, like, oh, a deer would be too obvious. We need to get something more... Uh, Exotic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Aww. But it's just as swiftly as the rash of sightings had begun, they seemed to clear up just as suddenly four days later on January 20th. That was a very quick panic. Uh, but it was enough that the Jersey Devil would become famous nationwide and worldwide and continue to live on in popular culture in campfire tales of the Pine Barrens. Uh, with the occasional sighting occurring every, you know, decade or so here and there, mm -hmm. uh, and we'll address more of that in the lasting impact of it, too. Before that, though, we need to rewind the tape back to the beginning of the story. The beginning. Actually, to the little bit before that, it's time to get the real story oh, of the Jersey Devil. Oh, okay. But first... We did a digger for the bones. Take five. 
You sure do listen to a lot of podcasts. I bet you even have a few ideas for a podcast yourself. In fact, you just know someone will want to listen to a show about how every episode of Murder, She Wrote has a thematically corresponding episode of The Love Boat. But how do you go about starting your new podcast, Murder, She Boat? Sequoia is the answer. Sequoia Productions is a content creation consultant specializing in podcasts. We have four years experience in podcast creation and production, and we can help you every step of the way to getting your show going and growing. From idea to formatting, to recording and editing, etc. Sequoia can even help you think of a catchy, memorable name. <laughs> Murder She Boat. We can guide you through the entire process of getting your idea out into the ears and eyes of others. Web design, custom logos and art. How about a bespoke theme song? All created by actual certified human beings. No AI involved. As natural as the mighty Sequoias themselves. Your idea is a seed. Let Sequoia help it grow. Sequoia.com. That's S-E-Q-U-O-I-D-E-A dot com. Boy, those bones. I tell you, it's something about those bones. I think it might be the new Sequoia ad. You know, those that, that Sequoia ad was quite an ad. Yeah, I just, so I just heard that for the first time, and I do approve that was super funny. Nice. Good, good going with the ad. Thank uh, you. I liked it. Okay, so at the very beginning of this episode, I made a very big claim that mentioned King Henry VIII. Yeah, you better cash that check your mouth. So here we go. Your mouth wrote? Is that how? <laughs> cash the check your mouth wrote, yeah. yeah your yeah, mouth's okay. writing checks that you're... Your ass can't catch? Yeah, it's usually what it is, actually. Yeah, I've heard that, too. Oh, so there's a sexual component. Uh, or a sitting component. Or you're just going to get your ass beat. I don't know. Oh. doesn't matter, okay? <laughs> no, the ass is doing the work in the metaphor. Anyway, so, so yeah. What's so in a very on? condensed way. Okay. So we all know the story of King Henry VIII. Of course, uh, he had eight wives. No, it, six. The eight. Six, Shoot. yeah. Uh, in Anne Boleyn. In 1527... He requested an annulment from his wife, Catherine of Aragon, because she hadn't sired a male heir. This would lead to the split with the Catholic Church and the formation of the Church of England. For divorce. Yeah, which was a uh, Protestant branch of Christianity, and this event is known as the English Reformation. Mm -hmm. This snowballs, in a way, and leads to a bunch of new splinter Protestant denominations and offshoots that start popping up. Again, this is oversimplifying things okay. uh, a lot, but that's kind of the context. Okay. So he does his thing. Everybody else is like, well, well wait, what is true in our religion? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'll bet it's like this. And yes. Yeah, so you mean we could just like. Everyone's inspired to rewrite what they want and have a new take on it. And one of these groups is the Quakers. Oh, yeah. Do you know the Quakers or anything? Yeah, about yeah. Um, uh, Quaker Oats. Uh, they quake around and shake around when they have the, the spirit in them. And I think Nixon was a Quaker, weirdly. Um, they That's actually, about all I know. They actually don't quake. They don't quake? Uh, that might be the Shakers. Oh, shoot. I was mixing <laughs> up the Shakers and the Quakers. Why are they called the Quakers? Uh, so, okay, they're called the Quakers. Originally, that name was derogatory. Oh. But just the, like the way Yankee Doodle became, like, we're going to, like, wear it. Yeah, so they're just like, we're going to own Quaker. Yeah, and it's because of the guy who founds the whole movement is this guy named George Fox, this English guy. Okay. And... When he was like 11, he says that he hears the word of God speak to him on a mountaintop. Ah. He's like disillusioned. He's like, dude, what the hell? Church of England? What is this shit? Uh -huh. and, uh, and God says to him that like basically anybody can be a minister. Ah. And it's because Jesus speaks to all of us through an inner holy light. And That's everybody... Nice. Anybody can interpret that holy light. Everyone right? has direct access. Very, Pretty much. Oh, that's very... <clears throat> and uh, they, um, yeah, right on. And they have, like, very progressive views for the time. Hmm. Uh, like, women are considered... A woman can preach. They can talk to Jesus, too. Yeah, right? What? Yes. Oh, right. Uh, All right. They're anti-slavery. Very good. They uh, are kind of like into democracy like everybody should have well we all have access that we all should have a say right this is uh making a lot of sense to me yeah so uh, of course the logical response is uh persecute the hell out of them oh yeah <laughs> well, stomp it down naturally so why they're called quakers though is because george fox is put on trial for heresy ah. against the church of england and 
he quotes scripture to them at which he in, in which he advises them to quake before the power of the Lord. Oh, and they all made fun of him for saying that. Yes. Got and it. So the Quakers, but then they're like, no. No, we, we're do owning it. that, dude. Yeah, yeah do it. We're do quaking. It. You should quake too. Everybody yeah. quake. So uh, the British Parliament passes this thing called the Quaker Act that explicitly <laughs> targets the Quakers. Oh. It demands everybody make an oath of allegiance to the king. Uh, something that the Quakers do not believe. They don't believe. No more talking to Jesus. <laughs> well, the Quakers don't believe in uh, like hierarchies. Oh, so they're totally anti-authority. Yes. They are like anarchists. <laughs> like strict, like wow. in the sense that they're like no monarchy. We are anarchy. Wow. Like, without it. Get now they're in England. They're not over in they're the They're in world. England right now. Okay. Uh, they start to spread because of this persecution. They yeah. Okay. So because they won't swear allegiance to the king, they're given financial fines and prison sentences and properties confiscated and mm. so forth. And so because of this, a bunch of them flee to the colonies. Okay. Uh, in 1868, uh, King James II, he's uh, actually, he's a Scot, he's a Scottish and he goes and takes the, over the throne for a bit. Uh, after, um, I think after Queen Elizabeth the first, he goes in oh, okay. and he's Catholic. And oh, so, so he's, he's reestablishing. Like, he's kind of, yeah, that's kind of thing. He's kind of reestablishing, uh, but he also is more tolerant. He's like, dude, you know, because the Catholics were persecuted. So hardcore. even though the new king is Catholic, he's not just getting rid of the church of England no. and going straight back to the Pope. Yeah. He's going to kind of do a middle yeah, way. And so he, he passes this act, uh, 1868, the act of toleration no. in which we will tolerate <laughs> the Quakers. All right. Provided they still swear the oath, and they're like, "Well, that was their big thing." And they're like, "No, nope, yeah, not, not no a dice, good, not a good deal. Too late." Mm -hmm. Somewhere in this this little mix up, William Penn is a Quaker. He comes to the New World and becomes the governor of Pennsylvania. Oh, he founds Pennsylvania mainly as a way for a place for all the Quakers to hide out and come to. Wow. Okay. So we already are now getting like. The foundations of the America that we know, our founding fathers, yeah, that's, Philadelphia. that's where Pennsylvania came from. Oh, it's wow. these Quakers. Um, it makes me wonder where the Sylvania part came from. Like, were they just like, well, we can't well, call he's it. Well, Penn. We can't call it Transylvania. Yeah. Let's call it Pennsylvania. It might be, yeah. Prior to this, there had been some Quaker missionaries who had gone into like Massachusetts. Oh, okay. Shortly after the witch trials kind of thing. Ah, Not a good time. No. And uh, there's two uh, Quaker women who are actually hanged in the Boston Commons. Oh, wow. The word gets back to England where they have this like, even though they have the act of, like they have the act of toleration and they want them all to swear to oath, but they're still like, okay, well, it's still not cool to kill them. Right. And so they actually like England sends over somebody to take over running Boston because of this act. Mm -hmm. uh, meanwhile, down in Pennsylvania, you got the uh, Delaware River, which runs down the Delaware Valley, which leads to New Jersey. Uh -huh. And at this time, New Jersey is actually split into two. There's West Jersey and East Jersey. Oh, okay. West Jersey, all the Quakers go to West Jersey, huh. which includes the Pine Barrens. Oh. The East uh, side uh, are people who uh, are really like loyal to the crown. Okay. And so this is going to cause a bunch of political ramifications in butting of heads because uh -huh. you have these anarchist Quakers in the Pine Barrens. Right. And then you have these people who are the, really the, pro. The, very, the opposite of anarchist, monarchist. Yes. yes. In, in the, Into all this mix. In the West. Daniel Leeds. We finally get a Leeds. We oh. found the lead. We're going to follow it. All right. Let's follow this lead. Daniel Leeds comes from England. He's a Quaker. He goes to the Pine Barrens area. And he has, he's got this plan on how he's going to make money and a name for himself. Almanacs. Oh, is this the old farmer's almanac? It's one of many. Okay. So this we're talking the, um, this is the uh, 1600s. And almanacs are a vital thing. They're really popular because, so an almanac at the time, it had... Uh, like recent news stories that yeah. nobody had gotten. So it's like a Reader's Digest, but it comes out once a year. It has uh, mm, short stories, lunar cycles. Yeah, and uh, things for farmers would yeah, need. Yeah, farmers statistics um, that they'll want to have at hand. And, and one reason why they're also really popular is you have like a page per day. Oh, it's like a tear off a day calendar. Kinda. And this is the time of outhouses in chamber pots. Oh. There is no toilet paper. And they're just and they're freshly out of corn on the cob. Yeah, so it's like you can tear a page of the almanac, you keep the out so it's your toilet reader, you're reading it wow. while you're taking your shit. And then what you're wiping a great your ass. use of resources! Right? Wow, I wonder what the uh, texture of that paper was. Oh, it's probably not good. pretty rough. 
<laughs> so Daniel Leeds says, I'm going to start my own almanac. And he does. It's the Leeds American Almanac. This is almanac spelled A-L-M-A-N-A-C-K. This is a C-K. Almanac. <laughs> he starts this in 1667. And in it, it has the lunar cycles. It contains zodiac signs and astrological uh-huh. symbols. Okay. And this upsets the rest of the Quakers. Oh, right, because that's like pagan. Exactly. Right, they don't like that. And for one, they're pissed off that he used the Roman-based names for all the planets. I mean, I don't know what... Well, the, what are the non-Roman names he could use? Oh, no, they, they all have, I mean... Uh, Christian names? <laughs> well, I mean, they're, they're, there's Greek names and there's Roman names, right? So Jupiter, Zeus... But they're still na- they'd still be named after gods, so it's still heathen pagan shit. Maybe they just don't like the Romans more because of the, the empirical the, the nature of The whole nailing Rome. Jesus to the cross thing, well, I don't know. Well, no, think about it. If, oh, if, oh, yeah, if they're super, yeah. If they're into democracy, they might uh, yeah. love... Gre- the hit like Greece, but dislike Rome. Uh, okay, I that guess. that would be my know. guess as to why they'd have a problem with that. But Either really. way, they officially censor uh, Daniel Leeds, and in 1690s, the Philadelphia Quaker Meeting, which is like the regional office, even though they don't have like hierarchies, they still have regional. Mm, meetings. They're starting to get a little bit of dog. Oh, also, I going. forgot to did I mention that they weren't called the Quakers. Uh, they, I mean, they took the name, but they were actually the. Uh, yeah, what are they? What are they actually? <laughs> Sorry, I, I think I, I got excited and skipped. They're the Religious Society of Friends. Aww. <laughs> yeah, right? This is <laughs> one, super of more, friends. More, one of the more wholesome <laughs> denominations of Christianity. Uh, but so anyway, <laughs> the Philadelphia Quaker meeting, they label his writings as works of blasphemy and heresy. Okay. Mm. This pisses Daniel Leeds off. He's like, what the fuck? You know, he's like, so he's so angry and like mad and beefing with the Quakers so hard that he converts it to the Church of England and becomes an Anglican. There are other options. <laughs> and then beyond that, he goes hard on the monarchy, like all in oh, man. to the monarchy. And the he, enemy of the enemy is my And he friend. begins publishing pamphlets and tracts denouncing Quakers, <sighs> anti-Quaker tracts and how they're, they're, you know, they're going to overthrow the crown. They're bad for the monarchy. We need to get rid of the Quakers. Oh, boy. Enter into this Lord <laughs> Cornbury. <laughs> Hello, Lord Cornbury. Edward Hyde the Third, <laughs> Earl of Clarendon. Clarendon. And Lord Cornbury. <laughs> Meanwhile, back in England, mm-hmm. uh, you got James the Catholic oh, yeah. on the throne, oh, right? Yeah. Uh, and then there's this Protestant guy who's actually from, like, He's Dutch, and he's William the Third of Orange. Oh, yeah, this, this is back when people were of Orange. Yes. Yeah. There's a bunch of people who are, like, pissed off that uh, James is kind of steering things back towards Catholicism. Like, no, we don't want to go back. We're all, you know, in the Church of England. Let's get a Protestant. So they ask this William of Orange, hey, we're going to overthrow our king. Oh, Come be the king of England. Boy, what a messy uh, what a messy thing it is. This leads to a thing the called the Glorious Revolution of 1688. Cornbury gets caught up in this because he's got a regiment. He's, he's one of the first lords to switch sides. He is sworn to allegiance to James II, but he, as soon as uh, William of Orange arrives on the shores with his own army, Cornbury's like, you're my dude. Oh, I pledge allegiance to wow. you. Switch sides. And then once Cornbury Game does over. it, it's like dominoes and all the other lords line up. And yeah, so they overthrow. Uh, James flees to France and you have William B- bigger, of Orange. Bigger army. Um, uh, oh, shoot. There is a term that kept showing up in uh, Crash Course in World History. Bigger army diplomacy. <laughs> <That was laughs> yeah, <it. laughs> right. So after the revolution, he kind of... He kind of falls out of uh, favor with the new King William uh, for various reasons, and he gets demoted. But then William's like, ah, no, we're still cool. So I am going to send you to the colonies to be the new governor of New Jersey and New York. Okay. So he gets sent there where he is uh, immensely unpopular. Uh, (laughs) People make a lot of outrageous claims about him, including... The scandalous claim that he was a transvestite. Oh, oh my. Which is, <laughs> I mean, at the time, if yes. you look at what people wore back then, I don't know. That's pretty silly. Apparently he opened some proceedings. Because they all wore tights yeah. and pantaloons and fluffy things. Apparently, but... <laughs> though, he actually wore a woman's gown oh, to really? one event to open something up. But he might have been trying to make some kind of satirical statement when he did it that didn't go over very well. Um, the humor was too dry for the times. There are... Uh, 
a few different paintings that are claimed to be him painted in women's clothing, but this might have been a smear campaign yeah, by his competitors. You know, if who only like him. he was also from Pennsylvania, then he could have been a sweet transvestite from <laughs> transsexual <laughs> Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> so he comes to New Jersey. He's like, hey, I'm all like new monarchy. And Daniel Leeds is like, hey, cool. I'm all super monarchy too. Oh. And so Cornbury is like, hey, Daniel Leeds, I like you and your almanacs. How about you come <laughs> be an advisor for me? Okay. So he's already beefing with the Quakers. Now everybody else in the area who hates Lord Cornbury is like, fuck this Daniel Leeds dude. <laughs> you know, because in their eyes, he's the Laura Loomer who's now sucking right. dick, right? <laughs> like, fuck this guy. And so they start. I didn't hear about him last week, but now that I've heard about him. <laughs> Fuck this guy. <laughs> right? Uh, the Quakers dislike him even more because they're like, the king who was like kind of cool with us. We don't like kings, but there was one who was kind of cool with us. And then you are like now in with the guy that got rid of that guy. Mm -mm. And, you know, there's no more toleration of this, us anymore. This is like the snowball of the of the calcification of, yes. of, of the revolution of America. Like, I know yeah. we're a ways away from it still, but. We're like, getting closer, and yeah, we're about, we're to, and we're about and more... to see some a very familiar name pop up. Oh my gosh! Who okay. is even more? Yeah, it gets crazier. The Quaker Burlington meeting of Southern New Jersey subsequently labels Leeds as quote evil in oh, 1700, boy. and they publish uh, a tract that is called "Satan's Harbinger Encountered," being something by way of answer to Daniel Leeds. At which point he is accused of working with the devil, and actually is called. The Leeds Devil. It was originally a political. It was like Crooked Hillary, Leeds Devil. <laughs> so <laughs> it was just like a term yeah. used for political smearing. Wow. Also, for the record, he had nine children, not thirteen of legend, but it's close enough. It's a lot still, but he, maybe not at the time. He I don't ends know. up passing the almanac business onto his son, Titan. Oh, okay. Titan, who names our kid? I'm the devil. This is my son, Titan. Titan, yeah, <laughs> <Right>? really. <laughs> <laughs> he leaves it to Titan, in, who takes over in 1720 uh, when Daniel dies. In 1728, Titan makes a design change to the almanac. He begins putting the Leeds family crest on the title page of the almanac. Oh. The Leeds family crest features a mythical creature uh -huh. known as a wyvern. A wyvern. Oh, I gotta see this this uh, this thing. Hold on. So it's called the Leeds Family Crest. Yeah. Or if you want to look up a wyvern, how do you spell uh, wyvern? W y v e r n. They're like dragons, but instead of having four legs and wings, they have two legs and a set of wings for their arms, which is biologically how that a makes a lot should... more sense. Yeah, they're like Game of Thrones dragons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Oh yeah. Here they are. Look at that mm -hmm. wyvern. So you Other have... than that, it's a straight up just dragon. Okay. Okay. So. It's a dragon that perches. You have these almanacs coming out with this image of a, a weird demonic dragon looking thing on it. Hmm. And you already have a guy with the name Leeds on it who's been accused of being the devil. Mm. You can see how this is starting to come together. In 1733, things get even more buck wild. Uh huh. So Titan gets into a public spat with a rival almanac publisher. Any guess who that is? Is Benjamin Franklin around yet? No Benjamin way. Benjamin Franklin and the Poor Richard's Almanac. That's the one I was thinking of, the Poor Richard's Almanac. They start beefing. <laughs> And it's it, oh, a very... I, would, I would not want to be beefing with uh, with Ben Franklin. He had a way with words. Oh, so here's boy. the thing. So, so Ben Franklin actually gets the idea for the Richard Poor Richard's Almanac. He steals it from his brother. His brother's publishing his own almanac called the Poor Robin's Almanac. I know it gets weird. Hmm. Uh, so then Ben Franklin is like, well, I'm going to do mine, and I'm going to call it the Poor Richard's Almanac. Now, why Poor Richard? Is is the poor, th it was Poor Richard a term, or is it just like a, a generic name, and then it's for poor people, like you would be? Well, the at the guy. time, the term poor actually meant, like, common. It's the right. common, yeah, he's the yeah, common, yeah, yeah, he's the, your yeah. standard. The hoi polloi. Yeah. He's the, yeah, he is. I'm the, for the salt of the earth. Yeah. Uh, but the name... He actually takes from the works of Jonathan Swift. Oh, poor Richard. What would that have Well, been? Jonathan Swift had a character that was like 
Isaac Bickerstaff. Uh, it's a pseudonym that he uses. And uh-huh. somehow there's Richard is in there. But anyway, he's actually inspired more so by the stor- story of Isaac Bickerstaff by Jonathan Swift. Because Jonathan Swift used the name as a pseudonym to perpetrate a hoax in which he accused a famous astrologer of the time of being dead. He he accused them of, that's a weird thing to say about someone so jonathan swift oh yeah well, of gulliver's dead. travels yeah 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 i follow takes on a fake name and yeah. writes a series of letters in which he says this other guy who's an astrologer and is predicting the future <laughs> I, he's actually i'm predicting that he's gonna die oh he will die and then he says oh in fact he did you know and, this guy's still alive so benjamin yeah so benjamin franklin <laughs> is like you know what I want to do an homage to that with the poor Richard's Almond. Of course, Ben Franklin would make it so, na- name his thing after an obscure yeah. writer's joke. So what <laughs> happens is in the 1733 edition of the uh, Poor Richard's Almanac, it starts with this inscription. I don't know how to do Ben Franklin's at uh, Ben Franklin. Um, <laughs> do you want me to do it? Can you? Can it's you a send long me the bit. thing? Oh, okay. He's, a, he's not foppish. He's Benjamin nah, Franklin. he's Benjamin Franklin. Ben Franklin. I'm Benjamin. Well, you were in it. <laughs> he's like, well, I'm Ben Franklin here. Well, I know you, you didn't. I know you weren't as into Hamilton, but there was a cut song uh-huh. that was sung by Benjamin Franklin. It meant to be in the style of the Decemberists. And it's just like, I'm I am Benjamin, Benjamin fucking Franklin. Franklin. I'm Ben Franklin. No, no, no. It was, I am. Uh, <laughs> anyway, we're getting off topic. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I might in this place attempt to gain thy favor by declaring that I write almanacs with no other view than that of the public good. But in this I should not be sincere. The men are nowadays too wise to be deceived by pretenses, how specious soever. The plain truth of the matter is, I am excessive poor, and my wife, good woman, is, I tell her, excessive proud. She cannot bear, she says, to sit spinning in her shift of toe, while I do nothing but gaze at the stars, and has threatened more than once to burn all my books and rattling traps. (laughs) as she calls my instruments, if I do not make some profitable use of them for the good of my family. The printer has offered me some considerable share of the profits, and I have thus begun to comply with my dame's desire. So basically, blame my wife. It's not me. Well, and he's just like, wives, am I right, fellas? Right. We're just trying to have a good time, and I'm poor Richard. I'm very relatable. Now here Read comes, my stuff. Now here yeah. comes the, the, okay. the, the, the twist. <laughs> Indeed, this motive would have had force enough to have made me publish an almanac many years since, had it not been overpowered by my regard for my good friend and fellow student, Mr. Titan Leeds, whose interest I was extremely unwilling to hurt. But this obstacle, I am far from speaking it with pleasure, is soon to be removed, since inexorable death, who has never known to respect merit, has already prepared the mortal dart. The fatal sister has already extended her destroying shears, and that ingenious man must soon be taken from us. He dies by my calculations, made it his request on October 17th, 1733, 3.29 p.m., at the very instant of the conjunction of the sun and Mercury. (laughs) By his own calculation, he will survive till the 26th of the same month. This small difference between us we have disputed whenever we have met these nine past years. But at length, he is inclinable to agree with my judgment, which of us is most exact, a little time will now determine. As therefore, these provinces may not longer expect to see any of this his performances after this year, I think myself free to take up the task and request a share of the public encouragement, which I am more apt to hope for on this account, that the buyer of my almanac may consider himself not only as purchasing a useful utensil, but as performing an act of charity to his poor, (laughs) your friend and servant, Richard Saunders. So, so he's doing, he's doing a riff on a joke by Jonathan Swift, who for the record is not obscure. I said that earlier, but Jonathan Swift was very popular, but like, this is very Benjamin Franklin y to like basically say, well, the other almanac guy is about to die. So you don't have to feel bad about buying my almanac. And he's doing this all as a huge reference to this other character Yeah, that I don't know whether he thinks most readers will get that it's a reference, but he probably is doing it just as a joke. He's trolling. And also, he doesn't even know. <laughs> he doesn't even know Titan He doesn't Leeds, even know Titan But he claims that they've been friends. Yeah, and well, he's doing a pseudonym. The, the character yeah. he's creating yeah, yeah. knows Titan. <laughs> so then Titan Leeds has to respond in his almanac oh, in 1734. Course. He baited him, and now they're having a fight. <laughs> so this is now this is from Titan Leeds. 
Kind reader, perhaps it may be expected that I should say something concerning an almanac printed for the year 1733. I have no idea who this guy is. <laughs> said, <laughs> said to be written by poor Richard, or Richard Saunders, who for want of other matter was pleased to tell his readers that he had calculated my nativity and from thence predicts, predicts my death to be the 17th of October, 1733, at 22 minutes past three o'clock in the afternoon, and that these provinces may not expect to see any more of his in parentheses, Titan leads performances, and this precise predictor who predicts to a minute proposes to succeed me in writing of almanacs, but notwithstanding his false prediction, I have by the mercy of God lived to write a diary for the year 1734 and to publish the folly and ignorance of his presumptions, of, of his <laughs> presumptuous author. Nay, he adds another gross falsehood in his said almanac, viz. that by my own calculation I shall survive until the 26th of the said month, October, which is as untrue as the former, for I do not pretend to the knowledge uh, to that knowledge, although he has usurped the knowledge of the Almighty herein and manifested himself a fool and a liar, and by the mercy of God I have lived to survive this conceited scribbler's day and minute whereon he has predicted my death, and as I have supplied my country with almanacs for three seven years by past to general satisfactions so perhaps i live to write when his performances are dead like it's like when ben franklin dies uh -huh. does he Th know this was Ben franklin who wrote this i don't know if he does okay. <laughs> thus much from your your annual friend titan leads october 18th 1733 three hours and 33 minutes p.m so he signs at the That's time these are dead right and and may i point out that he totally took the bait, and now all of his readers are going to know about Ben Franklin's new book because he had to <clears> respond <throat> to it in his almanac. It worked. And then Ben Franklin responds in 1734 <laughs> in his almanac. I'm not going to read the whole thing, uh -huh. but, just, but his response is, Titan Leeds is dead. Yeah, so he's just keeping with the whoever wrote joke. that. Whoever wrote that almanac is not Titan Leeds. It's somebody who has <laughs> who's stolen his identity, right? Or maybe... Maybe it's his ghost. Maybe he's the Jersey Devil. <laughs> mm hmm. Uh huh. <laughs> uh, so they, they, they do this back and forth to each other every year for the That's... next like several. So like 17, 1735, 17. So then now eventually. It's, it's known that Benjamin Franklin is publishing the Poor Richard's Almanac. At a certain so, point, yeah. So he must eventually catch on that this character is actually ben franklin yeah okay and so we start they start at a certain point it almost seems like titan leads kind of like is kind of playfully playing along it must be because at a yeah. certain point he then says fine tell you what i am dead <laughs> yeah. but now i'm a ghost and i can see all of the future through the power of god in the hereafter the spirit world so my almanac is way more accurate than yours yeah, ever I, could I'm be prophetic now yeah because i Cause see through I'm... the veil I've gone beyond the mortal coil. Oh boy. Titan dies in 1738, right? But Ben Franklin also doesn't like the monarchy. Right. And this guy is all in. He's well, he's like he's part of this monarchist loyal he's a loyalist family. You yeah. know, Daniel Lee he inherited, his father, yeah, he that inherited it. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. so there's even more reason to say, fuck you, dude. You fuck know what? You, You're ghost dead. man. Yeah, ghost man. <laughs> so you have, like I said, you have this guy who's called the devil. He's hated by the religious community in a very rural area where everybody's scattered around. Mm -hmm. The family crest is a demon monster. Yeah. And then, and then you have <laughs> Benjamin fucking Franklin saying that guy, that guy's dead, and he's a ghost. In fact, he's he, even though uh, Titan Leeds dies in 1738. Up until 1740, Ben Franklin is or poor Richard is still. Like beefing with the ghost of <laughs> fucking Titan Leeds. I mean, it was probably one of the more uh, beloved uh, sections in the almanac. Like, yeah. you can't stop. People were, I'm sure people loved it. <laughs> <laughs> so the particular details fade with time, but the really catchy parts live on in the memories of isolated communities and the creepy ass Pine Barrens to become the monster, the Leeds devil. Wow. Also, uh, there was another Leeds uh, family member, a person who was a Leeds in that area, who in like the 1730s, according to public records, named 12 children in a will. Oh, So the okay. two families probably got conflated together. And oh. that's where you get the story of Mother Leeds and her 13th child. 
Wow. So many different little tales that get confused and muddled over time and then lead together. That, that was a lot of strings that all got oh, to the Jersey Devil. We're almost done. Oh, that's <laughs> fine. Sorry. No, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm amazed. Because what more. about 1909, Garth? What about oh, 1909? Well, I, what was going I on? suggested it was an albatross. So people did see something, right. right? And what did they see? Some kind of big flapping bird. Well, there's know. one likely one, which is... The African hammerhead bat. Oh, the hammerhead bat. African hammerhead bat. Even though it is not found in New Jersey, uh, it comes from uh, parts of the west coast of Africa. It's the largest bat member in Africa. Its its wingspan can reach about 38 inches. Oh, I just looked him up. Wow, that guy has got quite... Uh, face the the nostrils are just bloom out with petals yeah. that turn into the mouth. No. What a critter! Ooh, he looks kind of like that camel. Yeah, in yeah. profile, yeah. he looks a little bit like that famous nineteen oh nine. Quite a image. bit, and he also has red eyes. I see, and he has red eyes. Ooh, so uh, he's, he's got a bat, fruit bat. bat wings, red eyes. He's a fruit bat. Some of the accounts in nineteen oh nine said he had claws. Uh-huh. Uh, in addition to the hoof feet, but you might just see the bat legs sticking down. This is the claws. cutest, ugliest bat I've ever yeah. seen. Wow, um, what a face. And of course, so <laughs> it could have escaped from a zoo or a traveling circus. Sure. And seeing as it's New Jersey in the winter, and it's cold, and this is an equatorial animal, and it's also a fruit bat, and there's no fruit for it to eat, it probably didn't survive longer than, I'd say, I don't know, maybe four days. Oh, poor little guy. Which He's is how long the, for the tropics. people were seeing this thing, right? Four days. Oh. The other possible solution, though, is a sandhill crane again. The no l- way. Yes. These sandhill cranes. <laughs> uh, they don't, because they're just like... Uh, yeah, what that was part of West Virginia was that moth, the Mothman. It's the fucking Mothman yeah, all over again. Yeah, yeah. Just like how <laughs> the Saint Hill cranes aren't often seen in uh, West Virginia, where the Mothman was, they also are very rare in the Pine Barrens. If it put its head down, it's as some of the people said it was a devil bird they were seeing. Maybe, maybe if it was friends with the hammerhead bat and the hammerhead bat <laughs> was getting a ride on its back. Por qué no los dos? Por- maybe both happened. Exactly. Uh, but then there's, so it, it's probably, it could have been a sandhill crane that was seen. And then you already have this hysteria that's going on and yeah. people freaking out. And then word of mouth. The rest writes itself like it fills all it of, in. All it always those, does. It always does. Yeah. There's also allegations of a hoax perpetrated by a real estate company. <laughs> uh, this was a theory that came out in the 90s. And the idea mm. was that they were trying to generate fear so that people would sell property low because they didn't want to be in an area where the Jersey Devil was. I find that one not that believable. I think that people actually did see something and then it exploded from there. And it's just and then it's just a good Interesting. story. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But, and one last thread. Okay. What about the Stanley Cup? I said. Oh, I, I, you, I you know said. What? I, King Henry I would VIII have never remembered this. Leads to the 1995 Stanley Cup winners by way of Benjamin Franklin. And it's because in 1982, the Denver Rockies hockey team, who themselves originally had been the Kansas City Scouts, were sold, and they moved from Denver to East Rutherford, New Jersey. Uh-huh. And of course, there's no Rockies in New Jersey. Yeah, but there are Pine Barrens, and what's in the Pine Barrens? Over 10,000 people voted in a contest held to select the name, and they selected the New Jersey Devils as their new hockey team name. And in 1995, the New Jersey Devils won the Stanley Cup championship and finally brought respectability and pride (laughs) to the state of New Jersey. (laughs) Uh, beyond that, there's uh, the Jersey Devil was subject of movies, comic books, an episode of the X Files. There was even a video game for the PlayStation. It wasn't that good. Uh, and of course, endless YouTube videos of paranormal believers tromping out into the Pine Barrens around Leeds Point looking for the Jersey Devil. But as we now know, you and I and you, listener, the Jersey Devil was only ever in the details. Nicely done. Now you stuck the landing with that. That was great. Beautiful, Garth's Corner. beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> All right. Welcome to Garth's Corner. We, As always, we start out Garth's Corner with the song of Garth's Corner. Ooh, 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 there are 
about two cosmic pets rarely seen. Who never need a veterinarian? The sun's got two dogs, but unlike Orion's sparrows, they're not for hunting. Cosmic sparrows, cause they're rain dogs. The sun's dogs come out in the rain. And as said, any fan just might tell you, if you see one dog, you'll see the other one too. They flank the sun on either side, just when conditions let them unhide. Cause I wanna know, have you ever rained in the sea? After drinking a lot of sunny tea, said he fan, oh said he fan, I'll bet you didn't know that I went to said con several years ago. Twas in the Bush administration when we made the worst of anticipation. There I met a science guy who you might know by the name of Bill Nye. Bill Nye the science guy. I want to know, have you ever seen a ray of sun that looked like a flash persist in the ether, shaped like an M-dash sitting in its tuffet in the sky, eating cheese curds and rye? Oh, said he fan, this song's for you, so I'll try to include the Drake Equation too. We'll talk about this and that and more in this Fortnite's Daylight Guards Corner. So, welcome to Guards Corner, and uh, yeah, this is going to be uh, not anything to do with Jersey Devil. I'm actually following up from a question on the Discord, which is, uh, what's the deal with Sundogs? Sun, what's up? Dog. What's up, dog? Sun with dogs? sun dogs, and there's some information about them, but to to fill it all in, for SETI fan, our newest uh, Monster Squad patron, um, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about the Drake equation, which has nothing to do with uh, sun dogs. So it's a little okay. It's a little potpourri. <laughs> <laughs> so um, <clears throat> sun dogs, uh, the, the the name originally is obscure in origin. Uh, just to describe what they are, in very uh, specific circumstances, on kind of a misty rainy uh sunny day where there's a lot of little crystals up in the atmosphere little little um frozen water droplets you will get a big bow around the sun mm -hmm. um sort of sort of like the a glory? others the yeah like a glory yeah the others yeah exactly the other side of a rainbow you know mm -hmm. you have the rainbow opposed to the sun yeah and then you get a similar refraction that's a big circle around the sun at about 22 degrees away from the sun um in all directions, it's a big circle, and sometimes you also get this with the moon on the yeah. on similar nights. That's actually more common. A lot of people have seen I a big to, ring around the moon. I remember growing up being told that if you see a ring around the moon, it's going to uh, rain tomorrow. Yeah, there's a lot of moisture in the atmosphere yeah. when that happens. Um, more people see that than than uh, ring around the sun. Man, I haven't remember seeing that in a long time. But I used to I, when I was a kid, I felt like I saw it like all the time. Yeah, it all depends on weather and climate and uh, global warming. Yeah, could be. <laughs> could. Stole our moon rings. But you might still see sun dogs, and these dogs are a a part dog. are a part of the ring around the sun. They're 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 always on either side of the sun, level with the horizon. So the sun might be higher or low in the sky. I heard they're real common in the uh, Arctic regions. Interesting. Yeah, that's because the sun is like right on the horizon. Could be. I yeah, mean, the, I, I've seen I've seen them once or twice in my life. Once for sure. Uh, when I was living up in Bend, Oregon, I've seen. Uh, I think once or twice I've seen them. And basically, that ring around the sun gets really fat on either side of the sun, and, and it can be very bright. It they they can be very bright and almost look like there's three suns in the sky all in a row. Yeah. So you have the ring, but then you have the two bright spots yeah, that are like it, clones it, of the they're, sun they're, they're similar to if you have a, a coffee stain like a coffee ring on a on a on a table and sometimes it gets a little fatter yeah yeah a little fatter and on either side i think i know why they're called sun dogs uh no one knows for sure there's some ideas that like they hunt track or follow the sun yeah that's what i'd heard that yeah. that seems most likely they were referred to that way as early as the 1500s and uh you can get way into the etymology of it, but basically the, the term has been around for a long time and the phenomenon has been around forever because it's just an optical yeah, yeah, thing. Yeah. So it's Ar just reality, Aristotle physics. spoke about <laughs> it. Uh, it showed up in the War of the Roses a few times. Um, it was it's important. Yeah, it was it's auspicious. It, yes, it was it was mentioned as a prelude to the Battle of Mortimer's Cross in England um, in 1461. Huh. And it showed up in uh, it dramatized in William Shakespeare's Henry the Sixth. Part three, 
that showed up there. So it, it's popped up here and there because it's kind of an interesting, beautiful visual phenomenon. And um, let's see, in 1843 in Newfoundland, there was the, uh, something called the Winter of the Three Suns, where there it was unusually cold and the temperatures were 3 to 10 degrees below zero. And there were a lot of... Sun you'd dogs. see sun dogs a lot. Oh, yeah, a lot of crystal. The winter of the yeah. three suns. So you'd see this real sun in the middle and two other sun dogs ever seen, on your side. Have you ever seen a white rainbow? Um, I'm not sure. Or d- well, does I mean, it work I mean, like a rainbow? Well, I've seen, I mean, I've seen moonbows. Yeah. But this is, um, it was up in the Sierras and it was a really misty early morning and it was so much mist. And there was just like in the mist on like looking west there was an arc of just white light in the field and it was not a rainbow. Like it wasn't scattered. It's like a rainbow had been scattered and then refocused. Was was it daytime? Yeah. It was early warning. Huh? Yeah. It was crazy. Possibly. Although I, hmm. I don't know how it worked, but I had other yeah, people that's who saw. Interesting, I was not usually, the only usually it would spray out as a rainbow, so yeah. it must have been some other thing. There's a lot of really interesting things uh, that happen optically in the yeah, sky. Right? Um, it, it's, it's difficult to describe very well on a podcast. It really, you know, whenever we do video versions of this show for some ch- choice topics, I can imagine doing a great big treatise on all the different weird optical things you can on see our, in the on sky. On our Tumblr, there's a short video of me demonstrating the sunstone oh, and the glories. Yeah, so with our last episode, uh, this is this is all reference to somebody asking about sun dogs in the Discord based on our previous episode. So yeah, if you go on our Tumblr, Cody shows how the glories uh, work. Yeah, what a glory looks like. Uh, behold the glory. Also, one other piece of follow-up um, from my buddy Justin. Hold on one second. Oh, yeah, there was a thing. Yes, hold on. So Justin uh, has said that John Quincy Adams was the congressman who would eavesdrop with his desk. Remember we were talking uh, yes. about in the Capitol building? If yeah. He, if the guy was in one very specific spot, he could hear people whispering yeah, in another spot. Because of the parabolas. So it was John Quincy Adams. There's also parabolic the f- microphones, which is when you see people in TV shows leaning out, of, like the, the oh, detectives, yeah. and they're leaning out with the thing that they're putting It's yeah. a parabolic It's mic. basically a giant ear because yeah. it focuses all the sound into one point. Yeah. And they have a little microphone at the dead center. It, it works like a radio telescope or yeah. some, anything else like yeah. that. So, uh, yeah, that was John Quincy Adams. Um, let me see. Sun dogs are also called perihelion, different from perihelion, perihelion or perihelia when you see the both of them. And you usually see both together. I've seen a single one. Sometimes you see one. Uh, the I, times I've seen them, they've been paired off. Yeah, I think I've seen them. I've seen one paired and then I saw one that was just a single spot. Interesting. Yeah, so the way. OK, so this took me some time to find. There's a reason like you might ask, well. Okay, I understand the ring around. It's kind of like, uh, you know, the rainbow is a full ring yeah. if the yeah, Earth, if the Earth wasn't in a way. way yeah. And the reason it works is because there's crystals everywhere, but you're just seeing the ones that are at the right angle. Yeah. And so naturally it would make a circle because those are all 20 degrees apart. But why would some? Why would there be sun dogs? Why would it burst in very specific points? And that is because there are plate-shaped hexagonal crystals suspended in the air and they have a certain shape where they will only hit your eye from not only a certain angle from the sun but a certain distance it it like it it narrows it down further so it won't you wouldn't see it anywhere on the circle you would only see it when it's perpendicular to the sun in your eye and they make a little right angle because of the shape of the crystal just like the shape of the crystal of the sunstone making the glories maybe so yeah, the, the, that, there here. could be something there's there. Something going on there's here. something yeah, going yeah, on. There's something going on. And sometimes, this is even more rare, you'll see some sort of sun dogs above and below the sun. So oh. we're talking about sun dogs at 3 and 9 o'clock on a clock face. Yeah. You might see them at 12, 12 and, and six. 6. That's even more rare, but there are times where you can see like five suns in the sky. I I don't know that I've ever huh. seen that. You know though. what's interesting? You know how the uh the Romans finally converted to Christianity? Oh yeah, I heard about that. Constantine saw a giant glowing cross in the sky before battle. That was a equal at, that was an equally sized cross, but I wonder if that was it. Could it be? Wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's a lot some of weird sun, shit that happens in the some sky. Some sun dogs have a little bit of a prismatic rainbow thing going where yeah. there's a red near the sun and blue toward the edge. The one It'd that be very I, subtle, but it's the there. one that I saw that was single singular did look 
slightly rainbow interesting or prismatic so uh yeah that's that's everything about sun dogs it was a little sparse and i wanted to throw in something for seti fan because search for extraterrestrial intelligence yeah as you know has With been around for a while I'm not, radio telescope. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not doing a whole Garth's Corner on uh, SETI. SETI because that's a huge one. Um, as mentioned in uh, the Garth's Corner song, I actually attended SETICon many years ago and met Bill Nye there. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, he was he was pretty cool uh, to me. And he... <laughs> so the other guy, he was a real <laughs> well, dick. Well, <laughs> yeah. He, he's been known to be a little abrasive for some people, but he was super cool to me. Uh, this is like many years ago. Um, <clears throat> I think I was probably right out of high school or in high school. And um, I, I found him and he had to go somewhere, but he was like, no, I'm going to get my picture with you. Come with me. So I had to like chase him halfway across because he had to keep, you know, he's a celebrity. Yeah. At, at least in, in SETICON, he's a celebrity and everybody was trying to get him, but he kept pulling me along till he had a quiet time. And then he let me take a picture oh, cool. and he was super quick with it because he had to go, but he was like, no, I'm not going to just, you know, do you still have that picture? Oh yeah. I'll, I'll post it. Yeah, we put it on the Tumblr. Yeah, you can see Young Garth with Bill Nye the Science Guy. So um, I am not going to talk about all of SETI. That's a whole lot to talk about. But to narrow it down a bit, I'll mention the Drake equation. Have you heard of this, Cody? Uh, isn't this one that's supposed to um, predict like the likelihood of uh, alien species that are capable of... Can, like radio broadcasting or, or just like they should be out there. Yeah, yeah. They, 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 what are the odds that there are aliens in the Milky Way, say? Yeah, yeah. We won't say the whole universe, but everything's but so far away. I feel like away. any equation that was come up with a long time ago, we, we know so many more parameters and variables now. Oh, should... certainly. Yeah. And we could do a whole lot more on the Drake equation. This is a quick overview. So it was made by Frank Drake, astronomer at UCSC back in 1961. In fact, I saw him give a talk at SETICON. Oh, yeah, he's okay. still around. And um, it's just an equation. It's as simple as could be. And he's like known for this, the Drake equation. Yeah. He's actually done a whole lot more for astronomy, but he's still known for this because it's a very catchy thing. Yeah. So it's basically a very, very, very simple um, mathematical equation where if you plug in all of the parameters, you will get how many civilizations uh, there are in the galaxy. Uh, of course, we don't know all the parameters, so yeah, it varies wildly. But here's the equation. All right. N is the number of civilizations. All right. Well, here, let me. So we're solving for N. Yeah, we're solving for N. The literal equation is N equals N star times FQ times FHZ times FO times FL times FS. Oh, very simple. Yeah. So it's just a bunch of things times each other. Okay. And each of those are defined as such. So N equals N star. Now, N is the number of planets with detectable signs of life. This stars is, is sounds like an the number of stars observed. FQ is the fraction of stars that are quiet. FHZ is the fraction of stars with rocky planets in the habitable zone. FO is the fraction of those planets that can be observed. The for L is the fraction of those that have life. And FS is the fraction of life which produces detectable signature gas. Yeah, no, we're not going to be able to figure any of that shit out. Well, it's not. The point isn't to figure it out. The point is, if you had it all, you could. So this gives a framework for trying to get closer to a number. Yeah. It's not it's not meant to be a to uh, me it sounds is, is as as useful as the Schrodinger's cat. <laughs> no, yeah, it, it's useful in this is a way we can at least narrow down some numbers and feel like we're making some progress. We're right. not going to know the answer tomorrow. It, it's unknowable. We don't have all the yeah. information, but we can narrow down some of the numbers and that's progress. So uh, to, to be more specific, it's not just the number of civilizations uh, in the in the galaxy. It's the number of planets with detectable signs of life. As you heard in some of those variables, it's fraction yeah. of planets that can be observed by and us. Even if we even if we saw those signs, there's no guarantee that it currently still has them. It just well, takes a true. long time for it to get to us. Oh, absolutely. And and uh, there's a theory that you know maybe life does occur often and, off and on in the universe, but it only lasts a couple million years. So if you were to look at the whole galaxy, yeah, there's probably thousands of civilizations, but, but they're, they're all, all offset in time from each other. So you just see one pop there. Oh, there it is. And by the time another one pops up, that one's dead already. And then another one comes up, but they're never at the same time. Yeah, as each that's other. Some, I guess sci-fi. Yeah. Never really 
Yeah, so there could covers. have been there could have been tens of thousands the, of, yeah. of civilizations in the galaxy, but they never lasted long like enough every... to be at the same time as one another. Yeah, it's like <laughs> you know, every time the Enterprise shows up at a new planet, they're yes. like, "Oh, they're dead." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, okay. So one? Go, uh, with reference to the Enterprise, they always mention M class planets. Yeah. Well, it's an M class planet. That just means that you can have a set and not have the characters in spacesuits because yeah. it's breathable air. Yeah. But that Which is seems sort... to happen at a, a rate that's suspiciously not not necessarily because they're going all over the alpha quadrant and they're going to so many stars. Maybe there maybe only one in a thousand has a good M class planet. So they're skipping most stars. So be they're still that's awesome. they're still yeah. seeing a whole lot of places because there's that many stars to choose from. So uh, yeah, it's um, it's interesting. <laughs> it's fun. Uh, that's about all. Okay, so <laughs> back, when, Sorry, back, when, he, back when he first came up with the Drake equation, his calculations were, well, I don't know all these numbers, but I'll take a guess. So he, he decided that there were roughly between 1,000 and 10 million planets with civilizations in the Milky Way galaxy. That was back in the 60s. Since then, people have modified the equation. They've questioned it. They've been critical of it. They've tried out new things they pointed out some of the stuff we've brought up and come up with vastly different numbers anywhere from zero to uh, a billion civilizations <laughs> but um we haven't heard from any of them so maybe there's some reason that there are fewer as far as we know we haven't heard from any so that gets into the fermi paradox and why why is there so much radio silence and uh, makes you kind of wonder, and uh, we'll get into that in some other Garth's Corner. But this has been a little s- s- sun dog <laughs> alien likelihood Garth's Corner. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what else to say after that. Oh, not a whole lot to say. <laughs> we jumped around a lot. Oh yeah, no, I I I really hope everybody was able to follow my crazy threads on the. Uh, oh, I, I followed it very well, and I had to. That was even like. I had other plans on how I was going to present it. And there was like more stuff that I was finding out someday. I'm going to have to like do a video that is my research process, like from start to finish. I think people would be very interested to see a that. lot of wiki falls <laughs> <laughs> um, rabbit holes and wiki falls. Yep. Okay. Well, um, who are the monster? Squatters? Yeah. We're going to thank our monster squadron. Cause that, that uh, Garth's Corner was in honor of our That newest. awesome Garth's Corner. Yes. So good. <laughs> Cashing that check. I hope it sounded good. <laughs> so the Monster Squadron patron producers are Travis Alexander, Vi Barbarian, Rachel Krieger, Tom Dahl, Justin Duckham, Kelly Flynn, Gunnar Franks, Carla Harrington, Havelock, New Jared, Ken with two N's, uh, Brian Lamb, TJ Levenhagen, Alicia Overton, Jordan Ramey, a different one, but the same one. <laughs> Blue Roan, Seti Fan, hey. and Tatum. And if you'd like to uh, be featured in a Garth's Corner song and get other goodies, join the Monster Squad, Duran. <laughs> yeah, uh, if you do it within the next 24 hours uh, of when this episode comes out, like I said, before 8 o'clock Pacific Daylight Time On in Saturday. California. Uh, yeah, it's Saturday. Because uh, we are going to hopefully be watching uh, a film called The Last Broadcast, which is about the the podcast of the '90s, a public access cable show I going into I've the Pine Barrens yeah. to look for the Jersey Devil. Cool. Uh, yeah, it's one of my old favorites from when I was younger. So we're gonna try to watch that tomorrow night. Um, so come join us, won't you? What else? Uh, Patreon already said it. Yeah. Uh, send us mail yeah. box 22 Redwood Estates California 95044 also oh, if you're signing up for Patreon make sure you do it through your web browser uh, not on oh, mobile we gotta remember to do that yeah cause Patreon's uh, or Apple's jacking up something yeah I think starting in November um, Apple you, will take 30% up on Patreon through your phone if you have an Apple iPhone yeah, they'll they'll take it. Yeah, through the us. web app. So yeah, just, just do it on your desktop. Yeah. Um just for not only us, but anybody you support. Yeah, on anyone, Patreon. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Although, but if you already did it before that deadline, 
Don't worry about it. Yeah, you don't need to unsubscribe yeah. and resubscribe. Yeah, It'll you're be ta- grandfathered you're... in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's just new people. Uh, we forgot to say that last time. Okay. Okay. Uh, with all that out of the way. So much. So much. Such things. Yes. It was a devil of a lot of things to think about. <laughs> the to Jersey. Now you know about the Jersey devil. Yes. Jersey. I really didn't do a lot of Jersey. It's a, the accent's uh, harder than I would think to do. Yeah, non road of ah. But not in a Boston way. But not in a Boston way. That's the thing. Or New York. (laughs) Or, yeah, or a New York way. Anyway. Until next time, whatever that is going to be, until then, the only thing that's haunted is you. I don't believe the Jersey Devil is even real. All righty then. I guess it's not my fault if he comes and eats ya. Okay, well, if he's so real, then what does he look like? He's got dragon wings and a half goat horse face with a chin strap beard like an Amish. And he's got hooves and horns and two low hanging balls with a button cock on top. Fantastic. The Least Haunted Podcast is recorded before a dead studio audience and is a presentation of Sequoia Productions, LLC.